We can't keep doing this behind her back, Dean. Marla's no fool. She'll figure it out eventually. Lisa's hushed voice carried an unmistakable edge of impatience. My husband's low rumble responded, She's so wrapped up in that damn restaurant she won't notice a thing until it's too late. Frozen behind the door to the study, my heart pounded in my ears. What treachery were they conspiring? Dean continued, Once I get Marla to sign over her rights, we can sell the place and be set for life. You and me, baby. No more sneaking around. The venom in Lisa's retort sliced through me. You promised we'd be gone months ago. I'm through waiting while you keep stringing her along. Just play it cool a while longer. His placating tone made my stomach turn. I've almost got her isolated from the staff. Once Alex is on board with the new concept, Marla will have no choice but to sell her shares to me. Stunned, I stumbled back from the door as their hushed bickering faded. My husband, my life partner of twenty-five years, was gaslighting me, scheming with his young mistress to steal my life's work and our son's legacy. White-hot rage gripped me, quickly doused by icy determination. Dean and his whore wanted to play games of deception? They had awoken a vengeful spirit. The scared, oblivious wife was gone. In her place stood a woman who would crush betrayers and protect her family's honor. No more Mrs. Nice Girl. Time to fight for what was mine. Over the next few days I observed Dean and Lisa with new eyes, watching their pretense unravel. The intimate glances, his habit of abandoning me for business calls, her over-familiarity with our son Alex, all became glaring transgressions I'd naively excused. But no more. With law books from the local library, I educated myself on documenting every infraction, every instance of misused company funds or inappropriate sexual behavior. A tungsten core replaced my shaken trust as I compiled undeniable proof of their perfidy. My sweet, oblivious Alex remained the sole vulnerability in my newly armored heart. Tutoring under the renowned Chef Dominic, my only child had helped revolutionize our menu and drawn raves, with ambitions of one day helming the kitchen. Did he suspect his father and childhood friend Lisa's intimate betrayal? I prayed not. It would crush the sensitive soul who remade my world after Dean's long emotional abandonment. No. For him I would persevere and stop at nothing to preserve our legacy. Whatever terrain lay ahead, I would match it in cunning and tenacity. The bitch and the bastard had awoken a primal force, an infuriated mother bent on reckoning. Marla the mouse was no more. From her ashes rose a culinary matriarch ready for bloody conquest. For two decades, I sacrificed my culinary ambitions so Dean could pursue his dream of owning a prestigious restaurant. I spent countless evenings alone while he schmoosed investors and tended to the business side. Don't worry, babe, he'd assured me, that charming smile disarming my doubts. Once we get the place established, it'll be our joint masterpiece. You'll be the genius chef, and I'll make the nuts and bolts run smooth. What a fool I was to believe him. When we finally opened the doors to Rousseau's, Dean insisted on being the public face and namesake, sidelining me to head chef. My innovative skills stuffed in the kitchen while he glad-handed investors and postured for the media. At each step, I played the dutiful, supportive wife. Telling myself Dixon family honor meant supporting the patriarchal head at all costs. Naive, blind idiot. Those musings were violently interrupted by the slamming of the bedroom door. Dean stormed in, mouth twisted in a cruel sneer. Your little gremlinashi chef ratted us out, he spat. Thanks to Alex's snitching, the staff knows about me and Lisa. This is your fault for pushing him toward that prissy culinary school. My pulse roared, but I met his vitriol with steely calm. Our son learned honor and integrity. Traits you've shamelessly discarded, Dean. Listen here, you sanctimonious bitch. The sharp crack of my hand across his cheek stopped him cold. No more insults, dearest husband, not after what I've discovered about your deplorable conduct with that whore. Rubbing his reddened face, he glared daggers. You always did take things too far. Not nearly far enough, I countered icily. Not after the ways you've disgraced our family legacy and defiled your marriage vows. Dean's smug look dissolved as I indicated the thick file folder on my dresser. I have comprehensive records of your financial indiscretions, inappropriate affairs with staff, verbal abuse toward me, and God knows how many other ethics breaches. His face paled. You're bluffing. Does this look like a bluff? I picked up the folder, 
letting the weight demonstrate the staggering evidence within. This is just a primer. I have more than enough to bury you in litigation and public disgrace should you interfere with my plans to excise you from this family business. For good. My husband's mouth worked soundlessly as the gravity of his transgressions settled upon him. Good. Let the depth of his betrayal crush that arrogant facade. Turning on one heel, I left him gaping, drunk on the intoxicating sense of having reclaimed my power. The months of being gaslit and emotionally starved had ended. Dean's downfall had begun, and I would be the vengeful force of nature to catalyze his ruination. No more meek wife, only a merciless ear for the fool who valued ego over family. From here, the path would undoubtedly bring more hurt, but better the sting of vicious truth than perpetual oblivious agony. My emergence was complete. In the days after my confrontation with Dean, an eerie calm descended over the household. He avoided me, spending long hours at the office that I knew meant trysts with his mistress. I bore his coldness stoically, focused on meticulously gathering evidence. Meanwhile, I made careful inroads at Rousseau's, reconstructing the crumbling bridges Dean had burned with his narcissistic mismanagement. Years of good faith had granted me deep loyalty among the staff. A shared lunch with Marie, the pastry chef usually frozen out by Dean, confirmed the depths of his financial improprieties. Over decadent profiteroles, I listened in dismay to tales of his lavish personal expenses on the company dime, all while withholding raises and bonuses from our hard-working team. No wonder morale was in the gutter. As if his sins against me weren't egregious enough, he had bled my life's work to fund his tawdry affair. This couldn't stand. Don't you worry, Chair. Marie assured me in that warm Acadian lilt. The staff stands beside you. Dean's pride has burned too many to ever regain our trust. Her kindly wink revealed the calico fur of her true stripes. Dean's arrogance blinded him to the viperous nature he'd cultivated in our ranks. Now, that seething resentment would be his undoing. I needn't have worried about Alex's allegiance either. One Sunday morning, my sweet boy arrived with textbooks and quiet determination written on his face. I want to implement a new small plates concept, he stated without preamble. Share-style dining is a huge trend we're missing out on. Dean predictably blustered when presented with the idea. Millennials will chase any shiny object that distracts from actual gourmet cuisine. We serve quality French food, no need to dumb it down with tiny dishes. Oh, shut it, Dad! Alex's uncharacteristic vehemence sliced through Dean's pompous tirade like a hot knife. Your arrogance is what's killing this place. You're too far up your own ass to see the industry is evolving, and your ego is choking our creativity at every turn. The crack of flesh on flesh rang out as Dean struck his only son with callous force. I watched in shocked silence as the boy I birthed collapsed, stunned to the floor. A feral screech tore from my lips. Before conscious thought could interfere, I was on Dean like a furious Valkyrie, fists hammering, nails raking at his coward's flesh. Years of swallowed indignities erupted in an incandescent wave. You arrogant bastard! I bellowed, literally straddling him and raining blows onto his bloody, contorted face. I'll see you destitute before I let you denigrate our son's talents again. His bulk finally dislodged me with a shattering impact, sending me crashing into the wet bar. Hazy pain radiated through my ribs accompanied by a brilliant bloom of crimson on the ivory tiles. Dean staggered upright, suit in tatters, face a ruined mask of shock and hatred. You crazy bitch, he wheezed. I'll destroy you for this. Save your breath, I retorted with a cold smile. My fingers clenched on a heavy crystal decanter, hefting the weapon with revitalized vigor. The destruction starts now. A heavy silence cloaked the restaurant's private dining room. Dean's beady eyes bored into me with palpable malice as Lisa fidgeted beside him. Across the table, Alex leveled an icy glare at his father, jaw clenched tight. You brought this on yourself, Marla, Dean said in that patronizing tone that used to make me shrink. Not anymore. Your unhinged behavior has left me no choice. He slid a manila envelope across the polished oak with a nasty grin. In here are documents detailing your alleged misappropriation of company funds over the past five years, enough to show a pattern of deliberate fraud. My pulse spiked as I registered his ploy using fabricated financial records to frame me, blocking my path to full ownership. 
I remained motionless, keeping an inscrutable mask as Dean's syrupy menace flowed on. It would be extremely unfortunate, he crooned, if these documents found their way to law enforcement or the district attorney. Your reputation in shreds, our investors fleeing, not to mention potential jail time. A tiny, satisfied smirk creased Lisa's painted lips. The vapid bimbo clearly relished this heavy-handed extortion scheme. Dean's beefy fist slammed the table, making us all start. You either sign over your shares to me today, or face total ruination, Marla. This is your sole chance to exit with some dignity intact. He thought he'd caught me flat-footed with his pathetic frame job. I gave him a beatific smile, reveling in his startled blink. This sad, desperate ploy only confirmed his irredeemable nature. Whatever soul he'd possessed was utterly annihilated by greed and ego. I'd wasted too many years mourning its long deterioration. You egomaniacal fool, I chided softly, still underestimating me at every turn. Alex tensed, lips parting in an unvoiced warning. But I raised a hand, maintaining my eerie calm. No need to play my cards yet. Make your choice, Marla. Dean's jowls reddened with barely suppressed rage. This is your last chance to avoid complete disaster. Enough of your juvenile posturing, I said, rising smoothly and straightening my blazer. Did you really think I'd go easily to slaughter? His baffled grunt was confirmation enough of his unearned arrogance. Time to disabuse the blustering fool of it. Here's what's actually going to happen. I opened my own file folder, removing a sheaf of documents. These are signed affidavits from former staff members, along with testimonials and financial records, all evidencing your egregious mishandling of this establishment over numerous years. With precise movements, I spread the damning evidence across the table like decorative bloom petals. Thefts of investor monies to fund your affair, a photo of Dean and Lisa in an intimate clinch, personal charges on the company card, itemized receipts of sprees at luxury boutiques and hotels, verbal and physical abuse toward employees, statement after statement of his unhinged tirades. Each incriminating artifact seemed to tighten an invisible garrote around Dean's thick neck. His mouth moved wordlessly as bitter recognition supplanted his brash confidence. I let the weighty silence linger a moment before delivering the coup de grace. Your extortion attempt is noted and comprehensively countered. So unless you'd like to spend your few remaining years behind bars as a penniless pariah, I suggest taking your leave now. Dean Crabb walked backward toward the door, tugging the whimpering Lisa behind him like a broken marionette. Let him retreat back under whatever rock he'd slithered from. His empty bravado held no power against incontrovertible facts and my unbridled determination. Once more, I'd reclaimed the higher ground through calculation and sheer grit. There would be no further chances for Dean to undermine me. The endgame had commenced. In the chair opposite, Alex flashed me a curt smile of savage pride. Time for our glorious rebirth. In the aftermath of my confrontation with Dean, a palpable shift occurred in the atmosphere at Rousseau's. Staff I'd barely interacted with in recent years suddenly sought me out, offering quiet nods of support and respect. Marie proudly debuted a line of miniature dessert shooters, perfectly tailored to Alex's upcoming small plates concept. Nothing too grand, just a whimsical taste to cleanse the palate between savory bites, she explained with a conspiratorial wink. Sebastian, our culinary manager long belittled by Dean, timidly broached resurrecting an old favorite, the Coco Vinili, a labor-intensive family recipe from my years as head chef. If the new direction permits such indulgences, absolutely, I squeezed his arm, warmth blooming at his tentative hope. Alex and I want to celebrate our roots while embracing bold new flavors. No more suppressing creativity to pander to delusions of haute cuisine. Word of the rift between Dean and I spread like wildfire through our tightly knit restaurant community. To my surprise, the reaction was overwhelmingly in my favor, a stark contrast to how swiftly I'd been alienated as an ostracized wife. That arrogant prick thinks he's the prime mover in this burg, Janine, the Cleveland Park Diner matriarch, groused over our weekly breakfast meeting. Time someone knocked him down a few dozen pegs. According to her, Dean's prodigal ego and mismanagement were legendary. His petty power games with vendors and open disdain for rivals had atrophied any professional courtesy. She and other owners happily offered to spread the truth behind his disgraceful misconduct. 
More humbling were the repeated reassurances from unlikely sources. The nonprofit director who raved about the youth program I'd championed for underprivileged culinary arts students. The city official I'd lobbied hard to streamline zoning processes. Even Clive, the acerbic but wildly popular food critic. Took you long enough to finally untie that ingrate from around your ankles. Clive chided over flutes of Prosecco. Let's get this establishment back to highlighting your singular talents, Martha Dean. Despite his churlish delivery, the praise warmed me. Too many had bought into Dean's congenital deception about our dynamic. Now the truth would emerge through direct actions rather than empty boasts. Not surprisingly, Dean isolated himself as his desperation deepened. My legal team advised stalling his countersuit as it flailed through evidentiary hearings best to husband resources and leverage allies until the timing was perfectly ripe. The first salvo came mere weeks later. Through some deft corporate wheedling, I secured prime reservation blocks for our soft reopening. A casual industry unveiling of the new culinary direction under Alex's genius guidance. The relaxed format allowed insiders to mill about at leisure, sampling bites both nostalgic and avant-garde. Sebastian's rich, deeply nuanced coco van was instantly recognizable to veteran diners. Yet it harmonized deliciously with whimsical flourishes like crostini with smoked bone marrow and avocado mousse. Effusive compliments filled the air alongside crystal clinks of celebration. Dean's ego would shrivel witnessing truly exalted gastronomy freed from his oppressive dogma. Confirming my instincts, Clive pulled me aside midway through, face uncharacteristically animated. My dear, this transcends expectations, an ingenious marriage of tradition and evolution. I could effusively praise these dishes for hours. Behind him, Lisa skulked through the throngs, alternating between drunken flirtation and caustic glares my way. Her pitiable bewilderment at the depth of goodwill only fueled my vengeful delight. She'll get hers, I assured the critic with a wolfish smile. This is merely the first delectable course. The dining room hummed with the jovial murmurs of friends and colleagues indulging in Alex's dazzling culinary reimagining. Looking around at the packed tables, I swelled with fierce pride at how we'd resurrected Rousseau's from the ashes of Dean's arrogant mismanagement. Of course, that smug bastard remained obliviously convinced of his control over events. His stunted mind couldn't conceive that I'd so thoroughly outmaneuvered him at every turn. My knuckles tightened around the weighty crystal tumbler as I spied that insufferable snake slithering through the crowd, his arm arrogantly possessive around Lisa's skeletal waist. The sniveling sycophant hung on his every word, utterly smitten by his largesse bought through my family's plundered riches. Alex's concerned gaze flicked toward me as Dean and his harlot approached. Summoning my composure, I gave him a subtle nod, fixing a veneer of icy aplomb. Well, well, the prodigals have arrived, I greeted them with mocking graciousness. How delightful you decided to bless us with your presence this evening, Dean harumphed disdainfully. Don't flatter yourself, Marla. We merely came to see how our son has perverted the kitchen into his faddish millennial blend of... Our son? The words burst from me like shrapnel. Let's get one thing abundantly clear, you malignant narcissist. The room stilled as all eyes turned toward the brewing conflagration. Dean's eyes bulged, face flushing thunderhead gray. Good. Let him writhe in impotent rage as judgment descended. Lifting my glass, I clicked the heavy crystal imperiously, commanding direction silence before continuating in a tone honed to surgical precision. For decades, this man perpetuated a reprehensible fraud in every facet of his life. He lied to investors, cheated employees of wages, and ruthlessly manipulated every situation to inflate his ego at the expense of talented, dedicated individuals like my son. Shocked murmurs rippled through the rapt crowd. None looked more gobsmacked than Lisa, crimson talons pressed to her gaping mouth. That's enough, Marla. I won't be denigrated like this. Dean's roar rebounded off the ornate walls as he took a menacing step forward. A derisive chuckle stopped him in his tracks as I slowly swirled the rich Merlot. Of course not, dear. We shan't delve into the lies, the abuse, and the serial infidelities just yet. From the corner of my eye, I marked Alex retrieving his phone, no doubt capturing the cataclysmic unveiling. Let's start with a few simple facts. My voice sliced through the electrified silence like a scalpel. 
As of 12 hours ago, I am the sole owner of Russo's restaurant and all its assets. After mounting evidence of your transgressions, fiscal, ethical, and personal, the courts have severed you permanently. Dean's face drained of color as the gravity settled upon him. You lying, cuh. Ah, but I'm far from finished. My smile was all teeth. Over the past year, you've engaged in illicit financial maneuvers to drain accounts, taken obscene loans secured against the restaurant's assets, and committed untold instances of tax fraud. A husky cackle burst from my lips at his stupefied expression. You assumed siphoning money to fund your blatant affair with this silicone-stuffed bimbo would be consequence-free. But every act of depravity has been meticulously documented and preserved. With a subtle hand gesture, Sebastian and Gary emerged from the periphery clutching thick dossiers. Every lurid impropriety Dean had perpetrated captured in triplicate through legal filings, financial audits, and good old-fashioned detective work. The jig is up, husband dear, I purred, lifting my glass in mocking salute. All your malfeasance has been laid bare. Spittle flew from Dean's contorted maw as he gestured helplessly at the crowd. You'll believe this vengeful harpy over your benefactor for decades? I let his tantrum wind down, delighted by the haggard despair creasing Lisa's porcelain mask. When all fell silent, I spoke the final pronouncement. Money is fleeting, darlings. Character endures through generations. Drawing myself upright, I glided toward Dean, radiating unflinching command. Consider this a preview of the darkness you've sown, and the karma your atrocities have merited tenfold. With that parting shot, I pivoted on one heel and strode away, savoring the delicious silence in my wake. A new era had dawned, time to bask in its glorious bloom. This is preposterous. I won't be railroaded by that histrionic harpy's lies. Dean's blustering echoed through the marbled courthouse lobby, temporarily overwhelming the hushed dignity of the space. His increasingly disheveled appearance and wild bloodshot eyes stoked lurid whispers from gawkers. I silently reveled in the pathetic spectacle as my legal team maintained stoic composure. The months of evidentiary hearings and depositions had meticulously dismantled his bravado, leaving hollow bluster in its wake. Save your grandstanding for the press, Mr. Wilson, Gerald, my lead counsel, advised coolly. Today's judgment will speak for itself soon enough. Dean rounded on me, flecks of spittle flying from his twisted maw. You smug bitch! You think parading that money-grubbing shyster around town has given you power? His meaty fists clenched until the knuckles blanched. Just wait until the truth comes out about your adultery and fraud. I arched one brow in mild disdain, allowing his impotent fury to ricochet off my implacable exterior. The truth has already surfaced quite decisively, dear husband. Now it merely requires a judge's imprimatur for formality's sake. A strangled growl erupted as he seized my arm in a bruising grip. You arrogant cu— Gerald's swift step forward cut the epithet mercifully short. Mr. Wilson, release Mrs. Wilson, or you'll be held in contempt before proceedings even begin. Dean's piggy glare darted between us as the implication sank in. With a contemptuous sneer, he shoved me away, stalking off in a miasma of spore self-pity. I barely noted his petulant retreat. After the protracted legal marathon, physical intimidation held no power over my deepening resolve. Without a glance at his retreating form, I refocused on ensuring every dossier was organized to ruthless perfection. Every scrap of incriminating evidence, sworn statements, doctored books, records of fund transfers, even a damning catalog of his romantic trysts with staff and vendors across the country, had been painstakingly preserved in triplicate. Exhibit A through oblivion awaited presentation to the judge. As I repositioned the Russo's company binder, a shrill screech pierced the lobby's hush. "'What the hell was that?' Lisa shrieked, stomping toward a flustered clerk while wildly gesticulating with her gaudy acrylics. I rolled my eyes at the hollow melodramatics. She clearly sought to replicate Dean's childish tantrums to rev her unearned persecution complex. A wasted effort, given the finality of today's inevitable outcome. Dean Wilson may be entitled to park in the restricted area given his importance and wealth— she spat at the bewildered young man. Only his apparent prudence checked any indecorous response. How utterly on brand for that insipid, money-scented succubus to equate wealth with entitlement. No doubt Dean was happily servicing her delusions in exchange for meager scraps of physical affection. 
my contemptuous musings scattered as the courtroom doors swung open, signaling our admittance. With brisk steps, I joined Gerald and the rest of the team, savoring the final adrenaline-laced prickles before battle commenced. Whatever petulant tricks Lisa or Dean attempted in those hallowed chambers, the outcome had long been assured. Their respective towers of greed and ego were destined for demolition before an impartial authority. Only hub hubris could deny the inevitability of their devastation. As I moved through the polished oak doors, I allowed one infinitesimal inner flourish, a gracious tip of the proverbial crown. Our day of ultimate triumph had dawned. Let the karmic downfall commence. The heavy thunk of the solid oak gavel reverberated through the courtroom like a doomsday knell for Dean and Lisa's toxic ambitions. My chest swelled with vindication as the Honorable Judge Ramos delivered her ruling in an unhurried, dispassionate cadence. Based on the comprehensive evidence submitted, this court hereby declares the respondent, Dean Marcus Wilson, has engaged in willful, multi-year fraud against his spouse, his business investors, and revenue authorities. My eyes flitted to the corner where Dean slouched, face drained of its customary bravado. Lisa's talons dug furrows into his beefy forearm with each damning pronouncement. Mr. Wilson's attempts to conceal funds, misappropriate assets, and mount a patently spurious countersuit have been systematic and reprehensible. The iron-haired jurist fixed him with a glacier's stare of contempt. Punitive sanctions and potential criminal charges may well follow. In the reverential silence, I allowed a small, satisfied smile. Poetic justice was unfolding exactly as merited. The judge consulted her notes, lips thinning. Moreover, the court finds Mr. Pang. Wilson's gross misconduct represents a direct violation of ethical and fiduciary principles owed to his estranged wife, business partners, and creditors. As such, the petitioner Marla Gibbs Wilson's request for a divestment order is granted in perpetuity. My smile blossomed into a full, radiant beam as she swept her gaze toward me. You are now the sole owner of Russo's Restaurant, its subsidiaries and holdings. Your monetary claims against Mr. Wilson are also approved to the full extent allowable. He is hereby divested from any profit-sharing, visitation, or claims to the business in which he has irrevocably violated the public trust. A muted cry escaped Lisa's garish maw as she absorbed the judgment's full gravity. Dean simply stared at his shackled hands, realization calcifying behind those roomy eyes. This is a farce, he lurched to his feet, spittle flecking from his lips. Yeah. That money-grubbing crone staged everything to rob me blind. Instantly, the bailiff was at his elbow, digits tightening in a warning cinch. That's enough outbursts, Mr. Wilson, the massive man rumbled in a tone of finality. Chastened for the moment, Dean subsided into sullen glares, broken only by feverish mutterings to Lisa. Doubtless futile plots to circumvent the inevitable already churning in those withered furrows. But I harbored not a shred of concern over such meaningless bravado. The law had spoken and the hammer dropped. Dean Wilson, once my loving spouse and respected peer, had been exiled to the howling wilderness of his own machinations. While his world crumbled, mine was only achieving a long-overdue rebirth. As the final proclamations faded, I turned and accepted Gerald's proffered embrace, an advance victor's celebration. The hard road behind had forged an indomitable metal, no more subservient wife or passive observer, but rather a potent force of righteous retribution. And this trial by fire had catalyzed my truest self, a culinary virtuoso and fierce protector for all I cherished. As Gerald murmured congratulations, I drank in the scene over his shoulder. My valiant legal army, the implacable jurist and bailiffs, even the shamed wretch now comprehending the futility of further resistance. Out there, Alex and my dearest allies from Rousseau's awaited the news, along with a full accounting of our brutal odyssey and the news that we had prevailed through unwavering integrity. And within that sacred space, cradled in the aftermath's surreal silence, an epiphany unfurled like the obliterating dawn, my war hard truly begun with this reckoning. Every anguish, every betrayal had sculpted me into something more primal and uncompromising. No more passive ingenue, but an empowered matriarch claiming her abundant birthright. Starting now, Dean's toxic legacy would be systematically raised until only my defiant truths remained. A blazing path toward majestic recompense and reinvention. The old Marla was well and truly entombed. 
here emerged the culinary Valkyrie, astride her long-coveted steed, spear poised to strike at any unearned usurper. Our vengeance was complete, but the epic journey was only unfolding.